I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to pause and to learn, to reflect, and to grow. And to the people online, thank you for joining us uh, from across Canada. And I know we have some people from the States as well. So it just means a lot to me that we're all in it together and we're all learning together. Uh, I look forward to doing the Ask a Therapist tomorrow where I get to interact with you a little bit more and um, try to really connect with you on a more personal and professional level to assist you with the areas that you want to know about. So Tony did a great job talking about me. I'll just be brief. So I'm based in Toronto. I'm a registered social worker. I graduated in 2006. Started working in a children's hospital specializing in autism diagnostics and psychopharmacology. I went into private practice because a lot of the parents were saying, my kids are just like me and there's nowhere for me to go. And um, that's when my journey began as a social worker in private practice offering mental health to teens and adults on the spectrum. We do offer four groups, as Tony was saying. One is Good Company. It's for autistic women and non-binary individuals. One is Navigating Work, and this is a group that's open across Canada to help individuals with their employment needs and to teach them how to advocate for their needs in work. We have Chilling on the Spectrum, which is a young adult group and Rainbow Spectrum Pride for our 2S LGBTQIA autistic adults. The framework that we offer our therapy is neurodiversity affirming. What that means is that we believe that all brains are different and this is a positive thing and we want to find the positive and strengths-based awareness to help people uh, grow and build their lives because as we know if you only point out the negative things about people, that's not going to help them grow and change. So we're going to talk today about the profile of autistic girls and women. And this is, uh, we have to 11.30 to, I'm going to give an overview of some of the individuals that I've worked with over the years, some of their shared traits, some of their shared struggles. I want to just talk a little bit about language. I use the term autistic. Uh, this is identity first language. This is what advocates really um, often say that they want to be referred to because they feel proud about being autistic. It's not something that is separate from their identity that they can carry as an accessory, that they're with autism. Autism is a part of who they are. So this is the language that I take on. You do not have to take on this language, and I apologize if this language rubs you the wrong way or doesn't feel right for you, but this, I just wanted to explain where my preference comes from. Tony was talking about some of the interests and talents that autistic girls and women tend to have, and there are clusters of them. Uh, we have Courtney Love, who is a musician. A lot of uh, individuals have perfect pitch. They can pick up an instrument and figure it out and teach themselves how to play. Sims is a common love for autistic girls, being able to manipulate the lives of others in a digital form. Uh, animals is something that really grounds autistic individuals, whether it's their cat sitting on their lap and calming them down, or petting their dog after a long day, or just being an animal whisperer and being able to connect with animals in a way that other people just can't. We're starting to see more people who are out um, in, in Hollywood. Here we have Chloe Hayden. She is the star of one of the characters on a show called Heartbreak High, and she plays an autistic teen in the show. Um, also, I'm sure you've seen either yourself or the people you work with, a love of reading. They'll immerse themselves in books, in fan fiction. They'll disappear into fantasy worlds and feel safe and happy there. Or maybe they like to move their bodies through dance or gymnastics. And also autistic artists like April Griffin who painted the image that we see with the woman with the red hair. There are a lot of uh, talents that come from autistic people, and many of it comes from the ability to sit, be in your own world, focus, and spend time to teach yourself a talent or skill. Another common trait is a sense of justice. How many times have you heard someone say, that's not right, that's not fair? There's a strong sense of morality in autistic people, especially girls and women. We have Greta Thunberg, who talks about uh, saving the climate and saving the world. 
Haley Moss, who is a lawyer. She's one of the first openly autistic uh, lawyers who is practicing in Florida. And she's using her autism to educate others about the potential for autistic people and the abilities that they have. I'm going to just watch a short clip about the role that passionate interests play in people's lives. And this is Olivia Hopps. She's just one of the very many, many, many autistic youth and adults who are on YouTube talking about their experiences. And I have to say, if you want to learn about autism, go to the source. I mean, I'm here today. You can listen to me too. But in general, listen to autistic people because they uh, know what it is like to be autistic. Now, what are autistic special interests? They're basically anything that an autistic person is super passionate about and loves. And it can be, you know, a topic such as like science or history. It could be a thing such as a car or a sports team. It can be anything. It's just something that we're super passionate about and really love. And we usually know a lot about the subject. Once we become interested in something like we need to learn everything there is to know about it we need to know and we're just so involved in it you can kind of relate it to a hobby but it's like a hobby on steroids like everybody has hobbies and a lot of times neurotypical people they can have a hobby but they can like do other things and like other things and like you know not think about that hobby at points in time but for autistic people a lot of times our special interests are like very like the focal point of our lives <laughs> and are very very important to us and we can't just like not think about them we go beyond a neurotypicals level of interest and love for a topic and it can even like become very obsessive to us even special interests are usually very important to people on the spectrum and they can be very comforting to us i know that if i'm having a bad day or i am like experiencing meltdown symptoms or i'm coming off a meltdown i'll go do something that is a special interest of mine to kind of help myself recover and just feel better and feel calmer. So the reason why I'm talking about special interests is because I want you to understand how important they are in the lives of autistic people. Uh, they anchor their days. Uh, they make them feel safe and secure. And it's something that they can get to know. And I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. But another reason why they're important is because they can lead to careers. Most parents want to know that their kids are going to grow up and one day they're going to be able to look after themselves or support themselves. And if you can foster interests, they can sometimes translate into careers. I'll give you some examples. We have uh, Dora Raymaker here in the corner, the academic researcher. She studies autistic burnout. And there are so many uh, autistic individuals who are now going into academia and studying research that is meaningful for autistic people in their lives. So they're not looking at how many seconds can someone make eye contact for or looking at the different ways that a person can stim, but actually trying to understand their quality of life, their mental health, um, and how to reduce uh, suicide. A couple of my clients have become government workers. I think you can imagine why. Same job, every day, stability, they know what to expect. Uh, they don't aspire to get move up. Uh, they just want to show up, go to work, get their job done, and come home so that um, it's a predictable daily life. We have uh, the head here of Autistic Doctors International. There are now over 500 doctors uh, who are registered with this organization, and they support each other around the world. And I'm sorry, but I forget the name of the woman who, who leads that. But this is run by an autistic woman. Uh, also, a lot of autistic people are interested in science. I've had clients who uh, will tell me that on their way home from school, they picked up a dead squirrel, and they brought it home, and they dissected it, and they took it apart, and they washed the bones, and they put it back together. And I don't know any neurotypical person who would do that, but that's a really good preparation for being a biologist in the future. A few clients I've worked with are librarians or information scientists, kind of like the government workers. Everything has a place. Everything has an order. They like being able to archive information and sort through it. We've talked about uh, artists. There are tons of artistic, uh, autistic, artistic people out there. 
uh, graphic designers. I know uh, our co-facilitator of our good company group, Bessa, she also is a graphic designer. She's done all our graphic design work. And helping professions, there's such a misconception that autistic people lack empathy. And yet, um, a number of the people I work with are psychologists, they're social scientists, they're nurses, they're teachers, they're very nurturing in their professions. And a lot of them work with autistic people because they get it. They understand why that child is behaving that way. Or they understand um, how to treat them with compassion and kindness. So special interests can lead to careers. So please try to foster special interests and not try to eliminate them. So as I was saying, um, both special interests, but also routines, I want to add this in, because this is sort of under the umbrella of what you think of as repetitive and restrictive behaviors. Right? If we're looking at the DSM-5, so we're thinking about what is the purpose of these repetitive and restrictive interests and behaviors. Well, first, they create predictable and stable environments. If you've ever talked to an autistic person or seen how they feel at the end of a school day, you know that life feels chaotic and overwhelming. And when you come home and everything is a certain way or your dolls are lined up a certain way and they always greet you in the same way, life feels a little safer. So special interests and routines can be helpful. Um, also, there's a lot of um, lack of clarity of oneself. And I'm going to get into this further because I think it's really important and it relates a lot to mental health. But an individual knows who they are and what they want in the settings that they create for themselves. So if they have predictable routines, if they know what they're going to eat for breakfast, what they're going to wear the next day, uh, just what's going to happen next, then they also know who they are. They are reflected in those actions. If those things change, then they, don't, they often lose sight of who they are. Their sense of self is reflected through what's happening externally, and the external world feels unsure and unfamiliar. So routines and insistence on sameness is a way for things to feel safe. Routines are also helpful for reducing decision fatigue. Um, if you're autistic yourself, you probably know how indecisive you can be at times, or if you're working with someone uh, who's uh, indecisive, it's really hard to make a decision sometimes. There's so many factors, and I have to do my research. And, ah! But if you can eliminate that, if you have certain things already signed up and set up for you. Uh, a number of people I work with create rules for themselves, and I find this actually quite unfortunate, because it's really rules that restrict who they are. And I'll give an example of this. A teenager that I was working with who had just finished high school, um, at the beginning of the school year, she was, when she first started in grade nine, she was so excited. She knew everything. She wanted to put her hand up. She wanted to participate. And she did. And the whole class turned and looked at her. And she felt so uncomfortable. And she just wanted to shrink and disappear. So she decided after that day in grade nine, she would never put up her hand again. She would never participate in class. And she would make herself as small as possible. And she followed these rules until she graduated so she could feel invisible. And it worked. But unfortunately, it left her without any friends and also a terrible sense of self-worth. I want to talk about stimming um, for a minute. So stimming is self-stimulation, uh, either through movement or through voice. And this is also a way to be aware of what's happening to you. So when the world is uncertain and unclear, stimming is predictable input that you can give to yourself, that you control. So it can provide a sense of control. It is also a way to express emotion. It is also something that should not be curbed. Stimming is a way of communicating and expressing emotion, and also a way for individuals to feel safe. Another profile to talk about briefly is introverts and extroverts. So typically, I think when you think autism, you think of that quiet, shy girl off in the corner. But, but autistic people can be loud and boisterous and never actually know when to stop talking, too. I mean, there's both sides. And these are examples of those. So one is uh, Sarah Kerchak. She's an author, and she wrote the book 
I overcame my autism and all I got with this was this lousy anxiety disorder. She describes herself as an introvert. So an introverted person is someone who uh, gets their energy back from being by themselves, uh, but can still socialize. And extroverts, this podcast came out last month. It's quite good if you're wanting to learn about the journey of someone who, in adulthood who is seeking an autism diagnosis. It's by journalist Lauren Ober, and it's called The Loudest, Loudest Girl in the World. And one of the biggest sort of smoke screens that prevented her from ever even considering that she was autistic is that she didn't stop talking. She loved talking. She talked to her neighbors. She talked to the people in line at the grocery store. She talked to people on the subway. And it never occurred to her that she had a social communication disorder uh, because she loved to talk. So that's a little bit of an overview of some of the traits that I've seen in my practice, in my clinical work. And we're going to talk a bit about how are girls and women being missed and misdiagnosed. And uh, Tony touched on this a little bit. I'm just going to take a, take a drink. I think these articles are, are quite helpful because we're looking at hundreds of thousands of women that are going undiagnosed. We're not just talking about you know, five or 10. Like this is a whole wave of people, a whole generation of people, a whole phenomenon. And girls are getting diagnosed younger. There is more awareness, but they're still not getting diagnosed at the rate that they should be. Um, as Tony was mentioning, it's a, still looked at as around a four to one ratio, but it's much more closer to a, a two to one ratio of uh, females to males. In my practice, some of the ways that women have come to a diagnosis um, is from watching a TV, so being able to witness themselves in TV shows, uh, from the TV show Bones, one of the tech detective presents as being on the spectrum, um, even a show if the character doesn't have to be female, like The Good Doctor, some might watch that and see elements of themselves. And there's more and more shows coming out. There's uh, Extraordinary Attorney Wu from Korea. I don't know how many of you have seen that show, but a number of people that I work with say, you know, I can really relate to her. And she's not autistic herself. She studied Temple Grandin to learn how to be uh, her character, but still, she is quite relatable for people. I think the top way that uh, adult women are coming to a diagnosis is that their kids and family are getting diagnosed. So their, their child uh, first is presenting with some signs, maybe the daycare or the school is noticing some differences. And then they're going to get an assessment for their child. Their child gets diagnosed and they realize, oh yeah, I have some of those same features myself, or I had some of those features, but I learned to mask them, as Tony said. One uh, other area is through books. A 17-year-old that I was working with read The Curious Incident of the Dog in Nighttime for a book report project in school. And it took her one full year until she was 17 to have the courage to tell her parents, I think I'm on the spectrum because she read this book and she related to the way that the person talked about their own cognitive processes and she saw herself in it. But she had so much shame about making that realization that she held that information for a whole year. And that's really sad as a teenager to think that they have to carry that themselves. Another area where we start to see autism is through a major life transition. Uh, so divorce, moving, uh, moving from middle school to post-secondary or post-secondary to who knows what, right? Whatever comes next. These major life transitions uh, often cause an autistic person to really feel very destabilized. And a person who never had any other characteristics previously may suddenly start to present as being autistic. And I've seen this happen several times. It's quite puzzling for the family. Um, but it's this high stressor event that can bring out these um, attributes of autism. I mentioned before that sometimes just working in this field and working with autistic people and learning, like listening to them all day long and understanding how they are and you can start to draw parallels between yourself and them. And the other way is later in adulthood, met a number of women in their 50s going through um, menopause and experiencing autistic burnout. And that is the first time when they are starting to question whether or not they're on the spectrum. And what Tony was saying before about a diagnosis, 
it, at our clinic, uh, self-diagnosis is considered valid because we know how hard it is to get a diagnosis. But I want to talk a little bit more about that. And Tony mentioned quite a bit of this history, so I'm just going to touch on it. Uh, one of the first reasons is that the tools are developed and norm for males. So even if a girl was referred for an assessment diagnosis and they went through the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, it's quite possible they'd pass it with flying colors because it's just teaching them, sorry, it's just evaluating some surface social communication abilities that they can do that maybe boys cannot. As, we, as Tony talked about, the research is based on boys. So if boys were historically the only population that was really diagnosed, and then we continue to do research trials, just we keep dipping back into that male pot without really bringing in uh, research about girls and their differences in presentation. Masking is another thing that Tony mentioned. Thanks, Tony, you <laughs> did my whole segment here. I just want to define what masking is for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, masking is the conscious or unconscious act of suppressing autistic traits. And this can look like uh, watching movies and finding a character that you really like and trying to pick up on their personality and on their mannerisms. And I've even had clients who've watched videos of the world's leaders and stood in front of the mirror practicing what it's like to speak with conviction and practicing the hand gestures. So of course, if that person shows up for an assessment, and one of the things they're looking for is whether or not the person expresses themselves through nonverbal language, you're not going to see it because they have learned how to do this, but it's rote. It is not automatic. It is not something they've picked up uh, just from through osmosis like everyone else. Uh, the other gap is a lack of knowledge of the female autism profile. So people just don't know really that girls and women can be autistic. I often find when I talk about my work, the kind of reaction people get is, oh, oh, okay, I didn't know, right? And they just think of boys and then they think of men as they grow up. I think system divisions um, create barriers. So if you think about it, we have health, mental health and we have education and they seem to be different streams and they're not talking to each other necessarily. So let's say there's a child who's having difficulty focusing in class, maybe they end up getting in a, a learning assessment, but they're not necessarily assessed for autism. But then over time, as they're trying to get by in a world that wasn't designed for them and they're feeling overwhelmed, they might get a diagnosis of anxiety. And then their, their anxiety is quite high and it continues to be that way on a daily basis, and they just feel so burnt out, they get a diagnosis of depression. But the different, um, we kind of exist in silos, and there's not a lot of cross communication that's taking place from the different, um, from the different systems. And sometimes it's just because autism is not on people's radar. So oftentimes as professionals, we look for what we know. So if I'm meeting a person and they're coming to see me, I'm going to look for autism. I can't diagnose it, but I can certainly recognize it. And if you go to a psychiatrist who doesn't specialize in autism, autism, they're going to look at what they know. And if you go to a psychologist maybe who specializes in mood disorders or personality disorders, you might, might walk out of the room with a borderline personality disorder because everyone is looking through their own lens and they're probably not thinking about autism, especially in... Uh, young girls and women. But the right label can have a very positive impact. Uh, this is Sarah Hendricks. She wrote the book, uh, Women and Girls with Autism Spectrum Disorder. I do recommend the book. It's quite a good book because it talks about um, girls and women throughout their life stages. And she's autistic herself. And she writes, my head was spinning all my life with trying to make sense of why these things happened to me. Why I was so odd. Why I couldn't live like other people. The diagnosis stopped my head from spinning. I was able to breathe a sigh of relief and relax. And this is often the experience that we have with the women that we meet who are getting diagnosed late in life. It's an explanation 
for their differences and for their difficulties. Because they knew that they were different, but they didn't know why. And the labels that they were given up until now, they were not friendly. Things like odd, weird, sensitive, crazy. So autism actually makes sense. So oftentimes it feels good for autistic women to receive this diagnosis. I would say though, for autistic teens, this can be a very hard thing to absorb uh, because they don't want to think that they're different. No teen wants to think that they're different, right? They want to think they're like everybody else. And so having, giving this diagnosis, if you are a professional who has the ability to give the diagnosis or talk about the diagnosis, please do it in a positive framework. Talk about the things, you know how you're good at uh, really focusing in and doing your drawings and how you can tune out everybody and just really, I don't know, um, focus on your book. And you know, that's because your brain is really good at something called monofocus, where you can focus one area. And you know how it's hard for you sometimes when you're with your friends, you don't really know what to say. Well, other people have that too. And th that's called something, that's called autism. And all of this is part of who you are. Uh, the language that is used in diagnostic reports and in talking to autistic people, I'm going to speak to this a little bit later, is some of the most invalidating and negative language you could ever imagine. Like, I couldn't even imagine that a professional has the permission to speak to people uh, using the language that we do for autistic people. But I do have to say that we've come a long way. And what I mean by that is the next generation can learn about autism through TikTok. What? <laughs> but it's true. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of something called Put a Finger Down Challenge. I don't know how many of you are TikTok users. I personally am not. But um, it, the way it goes is you hold up 10 fingers, and then the person will describe 10 traits or qualities. And each time you hear one that relates to you, you put a finger down. Like, for instance, um, I think my daughter did one about put a finger down about having a best friend. And like each one was talking about like, you know what her favorite color is, you know what shoes she likes to wear, you know. But, but there's also ones for autism. So what's great about what's happening now in, in social media is that girls are learning about autism just by watching a 20 second video on TikTok. So we're gonna watch uh, this video of one individual following the put a TikTok, put a, put a finger down. And I wish that this was a, in translated, like typed out, but it didn't exist in that format. Hi, this is the Put a Finger Down Female Autism Edition. When people are talking to you, do you stare intently and study their facial expressions and their body positioning? But when you're talking, you have to look away to process? Do you struggle with small talk, but you fluctuate in social settings between going on monologues about things that you're interested in and not engaging at all in the conversation? Do you feel like you get lost in your head and you're constantly analyzing everything about existence and everything about the past and the future and exploring all of the different ways that things could go? Do you tend to check out and get lost in your own head even in public settings? Do you struggle to make friends or maintain friendships and commonly feel like an outsider who's just watching everybody else interact and you're not sure how to join in? Do you struggle to text people back or answer phone calls and sometimes take days or weeks, sometimes even months to actually get back to people? Do you escape through special interests? They could be normal interests like horses or animals or studying psychology or human behavior. Do you have trouble making decisions when you're overstimulated or in a very stimulating environment that's overwhelming for you? Do you struggle to try new things, especially if there are people around you and people watching you? And lastly, do you experience shutdowns or meltdowns regularly? Maybe even sometimes on a daily basis. So that's pretty impressive, right? That's like literally a 20 second overview. And it's an opportunity for people to learn about autism in a very accessible way and in a way that it's about their own internal experience of how they interact with the world. I would say there's quite a bit of overlap with ADHD with some of those as well, which, and we'll talk about that too, but in terms of like tuning out the world and um, that kind of piece of it. Uh, 
but we're, we're getting to a point, I think, in our society where we're starting to understand female autism, as I use the term here, a little bit more. I'm going to talk about sense of self, and this is a concept that I've never really spoken about in this way, but it's really come to my attention in the last number of years, the difference that selfhood is experienced when you're autistic versus when you're neurotypical. And this can be, um, I think, part of the underpinning of some of the mental health issues that come up and some of the confusion with borderline personality disorder where there is a, a fragmented sense of self. So the first one is interoception. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that term. Uh, interoception is the ability of the brain to pick up on what's happening in the body. And for autistic people, this is often um, experienced differently. So I'll give you an example of that. I have clients uh, who forget to eat throughout the day because they don't feel hungry or who stay up really, really late because they don't feel the cues of what it's like to feel tired. So if you don't know what's happening inside your body, it's almost like there's this mind-body connection where you're separate from sort of what your one side of you is doing and what the other side of you is doing. And that can um, cloud your full sense of self. You're missing important cues, internal cues, about who you are and what's happening to you. The next one is alexithymia, which is linked to interoception, because all of our, oh, sorry, alexithymia is the ability to identify what you're feeling and being able to put it into words and being able to express it to someone else. And a lot of, all of our emotions have physiological states. For instance, I don't know if you can notice, but when I first started speaking today, my voice was a little bit vibrato because my heart was beating a little bit faster because I was a bit nervous to get up here after all these years and talk to you about autistic girls and women and about my work. Uh, but if I missed those cues, I could keep pushing myself and getting myself in a state that is very emotionally uncomfortable. But instead, what I did is I said to myself inside my head, you guys didn't hear, <laughs> you got this, slow down. This is yours, you got this, right? So if you're missing the, your emotional cues, uh, then you might uh, behave in ways that go against how you're feeling, Make, behave in ways that are contradictory to your own emotional intuition because you're, you're not hearing them. And I have had more than one individual say to me, my eyes are wet and I don't know why. And they are sad and their bodies are sad and their minds are sad, but the, there's a disconnect being, to be able to pick up that information. We've talked about masking a little bit. So if a person feels that when they're out of the house, they have to always be someone they're not. So they have to please others, or they have to fit in, or they have to hold their body a certain way. It's really hard for them to know who they authentically are, because so much of their lives are in a state of role play. And this can even take place at home unconsciously. They might not even be aware that they're masking when they're at home. And this is something that we teach, is how to unmask and how to let go of some of that. Another area around executive, uh, sense of self is executive functioning, and I'll speak a bit more about that later. Let's say you're a person who's highly driven, and you have amazing goals and dreams and wishes, but you can't get started. No matter what you do, you cannot prioritize, you cannot get organized, and you cannot get started. Think of how that would split you and your understanding of yourself. It would create this cognitive dissonance. Here I am, a person who is striving, and yet I can't even get out of bed in the morning, or I can't even you know, get myself to exercise. I can't do the things I need to do. There's a couple other things I want to bring up. Um, one is time distinctions. A part of executive functioning relates to how one feels time. And some of the women that I've worked with, they don't feel time in the same way as we do. And as a result, past, past and present end up overlapping together. So if they're in a situation that is triggering a past event, they will immediately reassociate, re-experience that past event in the present. And it's very hard to remember, where am I? 
what's happening, and again, it's that disconnect between present self uh, and past self. And the last reason why I've seen um, issues with uh, a full understanding of self is through trauma experiences, which I'll uh, speak to. And we know that when someone has undergone trauma, that they have a fragmentation of th themselves, of their identity, also of the world. So if you take that layer where we know that autistic people are at greater risk of trauma and add that to this already fragmented sense of self, it can be very difficult um, really to understand what's going on throughout the day and very overwhelming. I know I'm covering a lot of content, so please feel free to write down your questions. We'll talk about it more tomorrow. I feel weird that we're not really talking, but that's okay. I'm gonna just take a drink. For those individuals who are AFAB or assigned female at birth, they are much more likely to experience gender and sexual diversity who are autistic. So up to 15% identify as trans and non-binary. And this is the reason why we took our group Asperfem and changed it to Good Company uh, because we realized that a lot of the women who are in our group are not necessarily identifying as women. They may be gender fluid. They may be um, non-binary. So now we've included that gender diversity within our group to welcome those individuals. Also, uh, from sexual orientation, only 30% of autistic people identify as heterosexual. These are all from studies that have been done. And if you want to read a little bit more about this, the Spectrum News article, Gender and Sexuality in Autism Explained, is a good source where you can learn more about this. Well, what does this mean from a, a clinical point of view and from a, being a parent point of view and being a teacher point of view? It means never assume that the person you're dealing with is heterosexual. Never, never assume that they're cisgender, that their gender identity aligns with the sex that they were born with. Use inclusive language. And what I've seen in my work is that people often don't come out in this way um, until they know that it's even a possibility. So I'm not sure if you've heard this before, but you might ha I've had someone say to me, many people say to me, I didn't know I could be lesbian. I didn't know that was an option. Right? So by exposing uh, individuals to gender and sexual education that talks about gender diversity, then people can start to see themselves in these external labels in a way that they didn't understand themselves before. Another thing I want to mention is this leads to double coming out of the closet, maybe even triple. So you come out of the closet with your gender identity, you might come out of the closet with your sexual identity, and you come out of the closet as autistic. It's a lot of coming out, right? And it's hard. I mean, I'm making a joke, but the, the reality is it's called minority stress. So this, this group of individuals uh, has an intersection of uh, minority experiences that means that going through life is going to be more complicated and challenging because the world is designed for a hetero, eight, uh, neurotypical person. The other thing is that when I've worked with uh, trans individuals, many times when they go to seek professional help, their gender identity is challenged because they'll say, oh, you're autistic, so you couldn't possibly know this. And they actually do not let them proceed in the same steps as non-autistic people because they feel that it's just a symptom of their uh, autism. So there's a lot of um, discrimination that is encountered in the medical system around this. I've talked about sense of self. Now I'd like to speak about self-other distinctions. There are diffuse boundaries, and I'll explain what I mean by this. If there's an autistic person in the room, and there's someone else who comes in with a big amount of energy, the autistic person will shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink until there's enough space for both of them. They don't assert themselves, they don't grow, the energy, the boundary of 
sorry, the energy boundaries are not like clear circles. They're kind of like, um, they're diffuse. They bleed together and they take on the energy of other people and lose their own energy. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this term before, empaths. Many girls and women are considered empaths and what this means is they pick up on the emotional energy of others. And why this is a challenge is because they become like overcome with the other person's emotional energy and then they have a hard time separating what is their emotion and what is the other person's emotion. And so, for instance, if someone else is feeling very anxious and they come into the room or they're with them, then they themselves will be anxious and they'll assume it's their own emotional energy, but it's actually the other person's energy. And this can make um, autistic people feel kind of paralyzed in situations because they are overcome with emotion, not just their own, which have we, as we've talked about is not always straightforward and difficult to identify, but also the emotions of others. And I think like in a classroom setting, because I know there are a lot of uh, teachers here, and thank you so much for taking the time to learn about this. They, kids can pick up the energy of all the other kids and the teacher in the room, and they can be very sensitive to the energy of the teacher and pick up all of that energy. And it can be really hard to learn when you are emotionally overwhelmed. And this happens quite a bit. So one coping strategy is to just shut off all of your emotions and become numb so you don't feel anything at all, or just to be overcome with emotion on a regular basis and have meltdowns, which we'll talk about. Another uh, self-other distinction is a diminished sense of agency. Oftentimes, autistic people feel like life is happening to them. They do not feel like they are agents in their own lives that they are make the ones making the decisions and making the choices that are moving them ahead. And this obviously can feel very destabilizing, almost like you're a marionette or a, uh, a kid's car on a string being pulled along by someone else. And it can be really hard to put the brakes on and stop and say, wait a minute, what do I need? What's right for me in this situation? I'm going to talk a bit about relationships and different types of relationships, starting with friendship. Uh, in the early years, we tend to see this kind of cling-on friendship experience where the autistic girl will find one other person to play with and they're inseparable and they spend all their time together um, until, and this is a very upsetting and real phenomenon, the other partner will decide to move on and just drop that girl and she's left you know, without any friends at all because she's focused all of her attention and energy on this one friend. Uh, another thing that is very common is to see a girl, an autistic girl, just kind of hovering outside the groups of girls. So she's not quite a part of the group, but she's not totally outside of the group, but she doesn't know how to insert herself into the group, so she's just kind of on the periphery. Um, Autistic girls and women need help building relationships. This is not just an age-related thing. Oh, yeah, we'll just help the little girls. No, um, teens, adults, they all need help. And I'll talk about some strategies um, in the case examples this afternoon on how to do that. If you are a parent or a teacher, uh, watch out for a bully that is masquerading as a friend. This happens a lot, where you have a very controlling friend uh, who tells the little autistic girl what to do and she just goes along because she's really happy to have someone who is giving her attention and this can be quite dangerous. Uh, friendships tend to get more complex after the age of 11 into preteen years and teenage years where friendships shift from just running around and playing in the playground um, to gossiping and talking and it's very hard for uh, autistic girls to keep up with that. So it's best to try to help support them to find people that with shared interests. If they really like horses, sign them up for horseback riding and have them meet other girls who love horses too. Or if they like uh, anime, you know, find other girls who like anime. 
I do not suggest that you just put autistic girls together. That is not helpful. You can't take two people who struggle to communicate and try to assume that they're going to be besties just because they happen to have the same diagnosis. It doesn't work that way. You want to put people together based on the things that they love because that's when you're going to see their strengths and their passion come to light. And that'll allow them to make friends with people who have similar interests. Uh, yes, autistic girls and women can be in romantic relationships for those doubters out there. Um, kind of similar, though, to friendships. So they can be like really fast and really instant. So you meet the person, and then every single day we spend time together, and then we move in together, and it's like, hold on a second. Like, let's take a breath. Uh, so the pacing of relationships are usually either super fast or super slow. Like I worked with one client who's in her 30s, and she met this guy, and she really liked him, and he really liked her. And after six months, they had kissed. And that was it, because that's what they were comfortable with, which is fine. But it's, you're going to notice that the pacing of relationships kind of are in two extremes. Uh, one thing that makes romantic relationships difficult is what I was talking about before with interoception. So not being able to recognize what arousal feels like. A few people that I've worked with, and I really don't want to um, take away from the uh, idea of someone being asexual, because that could be a very valid identity. But a number of people I've worked with over the years have actually just not known what it felt like to be aroused. They didn't realize they were actually attracted to someone until we broke it down and talked about the different body sensations involved and what that might be like. It's helpful to teach about the stages of intimacy, because in that couple that I was talking about who had just kissed, the boyfriend said that he wanted to have sex. Kiss, sex, kiss, sex. There's no in between. He, did, he was also autistic. He didn't understand. So it's really important. Like I actually drew a timeline in my office and wrote out all the stages, the physical connection points that would take place, and the emotional connection points before sex happens. But oftentimes, this hasn't been spelled out to people, and there's a very surface understanding of what sexual identity or sexual connection means. And it can also be a bit uh, dangerous because I have worked with a few families where there has been um, incest or experiences where siblings or a daughter is hitting on the adult father because they're feeling sexual urges, but they don't know what to do with them. And it's very important to sort of take away the shame in those experiences, but talk about uh, healthy relationships and, and safety. Also, in terms of agency I mentioned before, um, for some of the women I work with, it's, it's like relationships just happen to them. They're just kind of like going along for the ride, and they're not even really a willing participant, um, and they don't even know if they're in a relationship or not sometimes. So it's just really important to clarify these things with them and, and make sure they're aware of the risks involved. Unhealthy connections are far too common for our autistic um, people that we work with, whether it's you know, financial exploitation, which I've had um, with some couples where she didn't recognize that her partner asked her to get on the lease, sorry, not the lease, the mortgage of the house and the deed and the title of the house, even though uh, she hadn't put any earnings in yet, um, or it's uh, sexual exploitation. So let me talk a little bit about this and how it's difficult to set boundaries. Let me get a drink of water. These are the reasons why autistic girls and women are at risk, from my point of view, to be involved in uh, unhealthy or imbalanced relationships. The first is a developmental age. I'm sure you've met a teen on the spectrum before, maybe who was 16, 17, wearing a crop top, just like her peers, low-cut shirt, tight jeans, um, but is experiencing the world as a 12-year-old. So she's getting a lot of unwanted attention, or maybe even wanted attention, but she doesn't know what to do with it. So that, that spread between their develop, social and emotional age and their physical age places them at, uh, at risk. Missed cues and literal language. 
Uh, one client, uh, I'm smiling because she always talked about it as a joke, but it's not a joke, uh, would talk about going to the bar and uh, chatting it up with men, and then they would ask her, oh, do you want to come over? And she would think it was a sleepover party. And this is someone at the time, she was in her 20s. And she would always go over and she would expect to jump on the bed and have popcorn. Um, but it wasn't, and that definitely was not what these men wanted. And she had a number of unwanted sexual uh, interactions and experiences. And the sad thing is, she kept doing it. She wasn't able to learn from that experience. So she just continued uh, to put herself at risk because she really enjoyed uh, getting that positive attention at the bar and connecting with these guys and wasn't able to extrapolate from past experiences to learn for the future. Um, another thing, though, that's missed, actually, is you might miss positive um, wanted attention because you're missing cues. So someone that you might be interested in, too, is showing attention, but if you're not able to interpret that cue as something positive, as like flirtation, uh, then you might miss that opportunity. Monofocus is a reason for risk. So monofocus is when you're just having a narrow focus in one area, and this can cause someone to miss red flags. So for example, uh, if a person is really focused, let's say they're, they're sitting on the bus, and they're really, really focused on when is their stop, and they're watching out the window, and they're watching the bus driver, and they're waiting and watching, and they don't notice that someone has put a hand on their leg. And you're thinking, how can they not notice? Monofocus is that powerful that if you are really paying attention to one area, you might miss other things that are happening. Um, and this has happened uh, quite a few times with people that I've worked with where a touch doesn't register until it's too late, until they notice that something has happened that they don't want. All or nothing thinking. This one is quite um, unusual. It took me a while to really fully understand. But autistic people tend to think in like archetypes. So if they think about, and I've talked about this I think four years ago when I was here, but if, if you think about the idea of boyfriend, you think loving, kind, generous, um, and that feels so good to have that archetype. So when there are behaviors that don't fit in with that label or that understanding, there's nowhere for that information to go. So they literally just filter away this information. And what I'm referring to uh, would be like subtle incidents of abuse that have taken place, and they're not recognizing them. Oh, he loves me. You know, he's, he's just doing that because he cares for me. I have to go to his house every single day and not let one day pass because he loves me. He wants to see me and missing controlling elements of relationships. Uh, one client that I met with for a single session consultation, which is something that I'm doing now in my practice, was showing me pictures of bruises uh, from where her partner uh, had been beating her, but she still wanted to be with him because he was her boyfriend and she loved him. So she could not enter this information into this idea of boyfriend. Processing speed is a, a factor that comes up with uh, processing information, but also processing social situations. Because when an autistic person is in the room, they might be hearing the buzz of the lights, they might be noticing um, any other sounds that are taking place, any other sensations that are going on. So they're just constantly processing so much environmental information that they might be missing other cues and other information. So they might not realize until after a situation has taken place that they're um, in a situation that is dangerous for them. And the last one is people pleasing. Uh, autistic people tend to be very people pleasing. They want to have positive relationships because they've had perhaps a history of rejection or difficult relationships. And they're even taught compliance. If you think about ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis, I mean, autistic people are given candies uh, to follow the instructions and to try to shape their behavior. And they're actually taught not to say no. And this is very, very, very dangerous. We need to teach our students, we need to teach our kids, 
and our adults that it's okay to say no, because this, this translates into sexual assault. Uh, I was working with one young woman in her 20s who w was uh, experiencing a sexual assault, and she said to me, I didn't know I could say no. I didn't know that was an option. It's really important to let people know, talking about consent, about wanted touch and unwanted touch, and how to communicate that. So all of this vulnerability relates to trauma. I'm going to define trauma because it has a different definition for different people. So what is trauma? It's an event or multiple events that can change your worldview, that is highly distressing. It can also be the reaction to a highly distressing event. So sometimes it's not necessarily the event that took place that is traumatizing, but how people respond to the trauma. And the good news is, this is where you as clinicians, as educators, as parents can step in and provide validation. And we're gonna talk about validation in the INVEST model. But if someone experiences what is a traumatic event and then they are met with judgment or condemnation or blame, it's your fault, you should have known better, you shouldn't have been dressing that way, that could be the trauma, is how they react. But let's talk a little bit about different types of trauma that are common for autistic people. The first one is relational trauma. And what I'm referring to is relationships between people. Oftentimes, relationships end, and autistic people do not know why. They know that they cared a lot about someone, they thought it was going, um, going well, and then all of a sudden, they're blindsided, and they're dumped, or they're dropped, or they're rejected. And this doesn't just happen once or twice in their life. This happens throughout their lifetime. And it leads to a lack of trust with other people, because you don't know why things are ending, and it's so confusing. What have I done to bring this on? You know, why did this happen? And oftentimes, when it's relational trauma, there are no answers because you can't get the other person on the phone and say, why did you drop this person? Why did you dump them? Why did you ghost them? Why did you stop talking to them? So they're left with this open-endedness, and whoever knows anything about autistic people, open-endedness feels super uncomfortable. They really like closure. They like a, an understanding of why things happen so they can learn from them and move ahead. But it's not just relational trauma in like romantic relationships or friendships. It's also workplace relational trauma. Autic autistic people get fired on the regular and no one tells them why. So they can't learn. And this can create a tra traumatic ex experience where they don't want to apply for any more jobs because they keep losing jobs and not know what it is, that, why they're losing them. The next uh, layer of trauma that can take place is sensory. Sometimes sensory experiences can feel like an actual assault, a physical assault. One of my clients lived in downtown Toronto and she actually moved locations because in the alleyway behind her place, uh, there were these guys who would come and rev their cars. And then when their muffler would go off, it would instantly incite this level of anger that was so high that she would start screaming and stomping and have an instant meltdown and then pick up the phone and start calling people and leaving them angry messages, all from that one sensory experience. So sensory experiences can feel like a slap across the face. They can, and the reason why they can feel traumatic, too, is the unpredictable nature of them. You don't know when they're happening. Uh, so think about a fire alarm for a child at school. Uh, that can create an experience of trauma if it happens over and over again when they're not expecting it and they have sensory sensitivity or auditory sensitivities. I touched on um, sexual assault a little bit. I want to be sensitive to speaking about this topic. I don't want to trigger anyone in their own experiences. 
I was looking at a study that came out in April 2022, so it's quite recent, and it said that autistic girls and women are at three times the risk for experiencing sexual assault, and that two-thirds of it uh, tend to happen when they're very young. So we're talking about children, autistic children, experiencing sexual assault. It didn't say where the assault was coming from, but it's really important to educate girls at a very young age about touch, as we said before, and to recognize abuse and what it looks like and who to tell and what to do if it takes place, but really to try to protect them from having it happen uh, in the first place. This one comes up a lot, and it may seem like a strange source of trauma, but things not making sense. So I talked a bit about relational trauma and relationships end and they don't know why, but it's not just about relationships, it's really about all aspects of life. I'm thinking about one uh, student that I met with who <laughs> would get into a lot of trouble because she would tell her professors off because they weren't following the rules, right? Things didn't make sense to her. These are the rules and this is what the professor was doing. And how is that fair and right? But it wasn't just him. This happened in high school. This happened in elementary school. So this became a real trigger for her. So that if her professor did something wrong, it would immediately tip her into this reactive state where uh, she would get triggered and she would start screaming at her professor. Now, for those of you who have attended post-secondary education, you can understand that that's not a great dynamic to have with your professor, but she really felt like she couldn't control it because she just felt like things didn't make sense and people weren't following the rules, and the rules were how she made sense of the social world. Many women that I work with have medical conditions that they have to fight tooth and nail to actually be recognized. I think part of it is that when a doctor sees that their patient has autism or is autistic, something changes about how they view the information that they're sharing. And they might not give it as much weight as they do a neurotypical person. I hate to say that, but I do believe there is a certain level of discrimination that way. Uh, I know people who have had, um, I'm going to speak to someone who has had long-term COVID symptoms. And every single step of the way, they've had to fight and push to be referred to specialists, to see doctors, because their doctor was acting as a gatekeeper and didn't believe them. And because the conditions, some of them are invisible that they experience, meaning like they only are experiencing them internally, they, they are not getting the referrals they need. And I know another client who, again, was trying to get help with her doctor. She had to switch doctors because they just didn't believe them. There's a lack of belief. I think part of this might relate to aff affect. Uh, so sometimes uh, when an autistic person is communicating, what they're saying and how they present on their face doesn't line up. So for instance, um, one woman I was working with was telling me that she was suicidal and that she wanted to end her life. But she had full makeup, like more than I could ever do, and she was smiling. I want to kill myself. And it's really confusing for people because the affect and what's happening don't line up, and so they're not, get, they're not taken seriously, whether it's by medical professionals or other professionals. I am going to speak about the physical experience of autistic women and the pain that they have. This is a quote from the same book that I mentioned before by Sarah Hendricks. And this is the reason why I selected this quote is it literally could be uttered by any one of the female clients that I work with. I feel unwell most of the time, either a headache, stomach ache, feelings of anxiety, or general, general fatigue. There's nothing serious, but there's always something that means I feel less than 100%. 
Simply existing just seems to be hard work. One of my clients has had a migraine every single day of the year for the past year, and she has a neurologist, and she has a specialist, and she has Botox, but she is always in a compromised state. So here are some of the common physical conditions that um, have come up both in my practice and also in the research. The first one is hormonal abnormalities, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and endometriosis. Before I started working in this area, I had never heard of these conditions. Well, I've heard of PCOS, but I never heard of endometriosis. And this is one of the invisible conditions I was telling you about, because the only way to diagnose endometriosis is through surgery. Seriously, you have to cut a person open just to see that they have this. And so, of course, they don't rush to surgery. But what endometriosis is, it's the, I think I'm going to get this right, but the, the layers of the uterus, someone help me. Yeah, overgrowth. Thank you, thank you, nodding heads. Um, and so what it leads to is terribly painful periods, uh, often excessive bleeding. I've had clients had to go to the hospital because they were bleeding out. Um, and one of the clients that I work with, uh, actually, it went into her bladder and into her bowels. So it's a very, very serious condition. And both endometriosis and PCOS, PCOS can reduce fertility as well. So some of the clients I work with, we, we do some grief work around not being able to have uh, children one day, potentially. The other hormonal differences that I want to speak to are menstruation which isn't a hormonal difference as a girl, but having your period and getting your period as an autistic girl in and of itself can be almost like a traumatic experience. Uh, oftentimes there's a lot of pain. It's very difficult with the physical discomfort of the pads and the tampons, um, understanding the mood swings that take place. And the mood swings can be very, very severe and can be even more like PMDD, premenstrual depression. Uh, dysphoria, I'm forgetting a D there, Pre-menstrual. anyway, where the mood can drop down into a depressive episode on those few days right before the period and really destabilize the individual. Some research is being done now on menopause and autism, and there's a partnership between SWAN, um, the Scottish Women's Autism Network, and um, some researchers in Carleton in Ottawa, and they're looking at the experience of autistic women through menopause, and what they're finding, no surprise, is a decrease in working memory, an increase in autistic traits, and a sudden decrease in executive functioning. And this is, again, as I was mentioning before, a time when people are starting to seek out diagnoses because they're suddenly, their autism is more at the surface. So I've talked to, oh, now, in terms of um, oh, chronic pain and fatigue is quite common um, with fibromyalgia, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, there appears to be a connection between the, this um, connectivity disorder and uh, autism. And there's a researcher whose name is, um, I'm losing my memory. I think maybe I'm getting into my menopause here. <laughs> um, Emily Casanova in the UK, she studies zebra conditions, which are like conditions that are sort of little known or lesser known. And she looks at the link between EDS and autism. She's a great resource. Sleep disorders are common. I've worked with people who are completely nocturnal, sleeping throughout the day, up at night, or just have a terrible insomnia, can't get to bed at night, can't sleep, which of course is going to affect their mood and their focus. Chronic gastrointestinal issues like IBS. Uh, one of my clients has terrible diarrhea. Every time a stressful event comes up with her family, she can't get off the toilet. It really interferes with her ability to work, and it's very demoralizing. Migraines are quite common, and moving, movement planning problems. Um, with medication, uh, medications can be very helpful for autistic people especially to support their mood, but it's very important to start with a very, very small dose 
because oftentimes there can be a paradoxical reaction so that the opposite takes place. So instead of something being calming, it can be stimulating, or instead of having a stimulant, then puts you to sleep. So really important to start slow with medications. And because uh, this is, relates to what's happening inside your body, as we talked about with interoception, it can be really hard for women to connect with what's happening inside their body and be able to communicate it with other people. So we're gonna talk, I'm gonna mention this a little bit when we do the case studies. Tony mentioned the mental health impact uh, of being autistic and living in this world. And what we see, we tend to see sort of the highest uh, labels are depression, anxiety, and OCD. Uh, ADHD, which is a separate condition, it used to be that you could only diagnose either ADHD or autism. Now a lot of genetic studies are showing there's a quite a large overlap between the experience of autism and ADHD and some shared characteristics. Depression uh, tends to come up with what I was talking about before when we were looking at sense of self and understanding that disconnect between what you want to do, who you want to be, and what you're able to achieve. Um, and usually, uh, those people who are most aware of their differences are also at greatest risk for developing depression and developing suicidal ideation and suicidal behavior. Uh, eating disorders is very common. Anorexia is a way to you know, control a chaotic world and um, keep everything in check. And binge eating is a way to soothe at the end of a difficult day. Well, we've already talked about trauma and autistic burnout. So I've been describing a little bit about what it's like uh, to be an autistic girl and woman based on my clinical experiences, uh, having the honor of listening to and speaking with uh, autistic girls and women for the last uh, 12 years. And one of their experiences, and this is also um, documented in research, is a hypersensitivity to their environment. And this can really lead to a sensory overload experience. Um, if you think about just trying to get through a day, maybe they, they work in the city and they have to you know, wake up, get themselves ready, their kids are noisy at home, they get out of the house, they get on the train, it's packed with other people, they're all squished, it's, it's loud, the screech of the train is going, there's smells from people's meals and their perfumes, and even by the time they get to work in the morning, they're already feeling a bit worn out. Information overload uh, is a common occurrence. It just, they process information at a different rate, and so there's a lot coming at them, and it can feel like too much. I think about um, individuals that I work with and coaching them in doctor's appointments, saying things like, give me a second to write this down, or bringing someone else with them to the appointment so they can be a witness and listen as well. But just taking in too much information, even participating in today's training, can create an overload. And an emotional overload. So if you're not picking up on your subtle emotional cues, and your emotions are building and building and building, and you're not noticing them until they're really, really big, this can create an emotional overload. And think of having all of these three things together, or maybe just one big thing that pushes you over the edge. And this can lead to a meltdown or a shutdown. So a meltdown is, the, as I said, the buildup of these experiences that can come out in an external way. It can present as crying, sobbing, screaming, swearing, throwing things. Um, it can even look like a temper tantrum, but the difference between a tantrum and a meltdown is a tantrum is an intentional behavior to try to get something you want, and a meltdown is the, the nervous system that's really just been pushed over the edge. Uh, a shutdown is the opposite, so instead of externalizing your experiences, you're internalizing them. Uh, you, you may uh, become very, very quiet, and you might even in those moments lose the ability to move and lose the ability to speak. And some of my clients have created ways that they can communicate with their partners or their family or anyone that finds them in public in this state through text because they've lost the ability to speak out loud. 
Meltdowns and shutdowns are exhausting, but at the same time, they can really create a sense of relief because there's a lot of energy, built up energy that is expended. But oftentimes, people feel a sense of shame afterwards uh, because they have spent so much of their time trying to be in control, in control of themselves, in control of their environments. And with a meltdown or a shutdown, they lose control. And they may say things that they regret or behave in ways that they feel embarrassed about. So it's very important to support individuals uh, post meltdown or shutdown um, and really provide a validation. No presentation at this time is complete without talking about COVID and mental health. We know this population is at greater risk for experiencing mental health difficulties, but how did COVID play into this? Well, COVID suddenly took away a lot of structure for people. And as I've talked about earlier, structure are one of the foundations of things that make them feel like themselves and make them feel okay. So when that structure was taken away, when that was eroded, that was very destabilizing. Um, they often lost their routines or going to their favorite places. The people, they'd show up at their favorite coffee shop and their worker, the person, the barista would always say their name and say hello. All of those interactions suddenly disintegrated. So again, this sense of loss of self and increased anxiety. Also, because COVID went through so many changes, at least in Ontario, it was a lockdown and then, okay, you could go back, you could leave the house and then it was a lockdown again. All those transitions were really challenging for autistic people. Um, also, it was hard for them to know what the rules were because the rules kept changing and they really wanted to follow the rules and that was anxiety provoking as well. Uh, for people who are working, bringing the workplace into the home meant they lost that separation between work and personal life. And as we know, barriers can be difficult. So that was difficult for people. They were, had a hard time focusing a lot of the time because the environmental cues of being out of the house allowed them to know I'm at work and being home was their workspace, so that was difficult. Online learning for some kids was just a complete joke. I mean, they just were not able to sit and pay attention and be engaged. It was also helpful for others, so it wasn't bad for everybody. Uh, but we need to think about post-COVID reintegration and what that looks like. Uh, thinking about doing things gradually, doing things intentionally, doing things mindfully, and recognizing that the, some of the skills and abilities that people had pre-COVID may have to be relearned and retaught. So it's not like you can just jump back into the way things used to be. But the good news is one thing that I've really learned about uh, my work is that uh, autistic people are incredibly resilient. Um, they keep trying, they keep going at it, and they have um, Im immense strengths. So it really uh, sets them up for being able to live lives that are, are well for them.